I had my own ab abandonment issues and there's like, and as a kid, I'm just gonna call this out too, because I feel like this is so important and it doesn't matter how many times we hear it, we, we need to hear it more. Unconsciously as children, when we are not treated well, when we are not treated with the love that we all deserve, our brains, our own internal coping mechanisms come in to help and they don't always help in the best ways. It just helps us to make sense of things and sometimes it makes sense of things in like the worst possible ways. Prepared to be inspired. Today I'm super excited about my guest. We're welcoming the phenomenal Dr. Margie Serrato. She's a first generation American and a groundbreaking cultural anthropologist. Margie has delved into the depths of gender, sexuality, and ethnic diversity. Now as a transformative coach, she blends 25 years of expertise with personal growth insights to help others unlock their true potential. Join us for this enlightening journey through her incredible story and the wisdom she imparts. Go grab your favorite drink, pull up a chair, because trust me, you're not going to want to miss this episode. What is the question that wants to be asked? I feel like sometimes, you know, when we, we meet people, we might have like this urge that like of a question that we want to ask them, whether it's because it like their face or their energy or something they said, like, or something they're wearing, right? Like, like, like is bringing something to our attention that just wants to surface, but we yeah. just repress it because that's not how we're taught to interact, right? There's this formula for interaction when you meet someone for the first time, right? Yeah. Oh, you know, and you do the, the formalities and the niceties and the, you start, you start, you start slow, right? And you start on the surface. And I have learned, honestly, like just me, just who I am, as well as the kind of energy that I bring out in people mm -hmm. is really, we're going deep right now. <laughs> like, and people just, they're not scared of it. It's like this, there's this feeling and, and I've learned to acknowledge it in the past few years. There's this feeling with me that I, I have to, I have to receive and allow, which is I have this energy that people feel sa safe with and they feel like they can trust me. And I hold that trust in very high regard um, because I recognize that it's, it's, it's sacred, right? Yeah. It's, it's valuable. It's important. It's also rare. It's uncommon for you to find, to meet someone for the first time and to feel like this person can hold you no matter what you tell them, no matter what soft, hard, broken, vulnerable parts of yourself feel like need to come out and, and be in the space with you. Yeah. Right? And so that's why I'm like, well, okay, we'll just, what feels like the thing that wants to come out right now? Maybe. <laughs> Well, I like that because it's interesting that you say that because I am one of those people that no matter who I encounter, I end up getting their life stories. Same right? It's like, let's just go deep right away. Like, and I, I have example after example of like, you know, I've even put earbuds in my ears on the plane and like, I just don't want to talk to anybody right now. I just want to, and I get the, <laughs> I'm like, are you kidding? me <laughs> right <laughs> i was like do you not see i have ear but it's like no we don't care like i want to talk to you and i'm like okay so <laughs> i love that because i think to your point it is rare and we do the basic things like right here's what i know about you here's what i want to ask about you i've been intrigued to talk to you because of being an anthropologist i'm a geek for that kind of thing you know what I mean? And I've never been able to interact or no, I don't know of an anthropology. You know what I mean? So when I saw you, I was like, oh my God. Yeah. Like I want to know all the things I want to yeah, know right. all your experiences. I want to know like what led you from there to like, why did you even get into Like, there's just so many questions I could ask you. Just all right. Well, let's just go with that. Right. And so in this case, you know, you know, you know something about me that immediately like piqued your curiosity and let's just go with that. And right. it, because I feel like it's super relevant to who I am now, to who I've always been, to your podcast. Um, I feel like it's actually going to be super awesome to be able to bring all of that in together. All right. So, wild ride. All right. So, 
Backstory on me, I'm a first generation American. I'm a first generation college student. So my family's from Colombia and my grandfather migrated here in like the early 70s to New York City, like the quintessential, like, you know, immigrants seeking, you know, the American dream story, right? The land of opportunity on all these things. And there's a lot there, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip ahead to like, maybe like the poignant pieces that led to me getting into anthropology. Because I'm the first generation American, I got to experience the challenge of being raised in a place with a very different culture than my heritage mm -hmm. and yet having my family try to instill that heritage right right in ways that like there's parts of like keeping keeping your ancestry and your culture alive that are really important and matter and we should absolutely celebrate it mm -hmm. and then there's also things that when you're going to a new place, you can't have this expectation of taking the old with you and living the old ways with you in the new place. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. And all it creates is a sense of frustration for everybody, for the people who came here from a different place, as well as for the people who only know this place because they were born here. Right. right. So like from an intergenerational kind of perspective, it's something that we have a lot of uh, feel like existential crises and identity crises about, right? This issue of like trying to hold on to the old ways and being in a new place, trying to assimilate, right? Trying to blend in and belong and feeling like you neither belong to the old place nor do you belong to this new place. And what the hell do you do with all of that, <laughs> right? And it's a really big, deep sense of loss and dis, just it's disconcerting because you never feel like there's a there's a place where you fit in and you belong and you're constantly your whole life searching for that searching for that place where you belong searching for that context where you feel like you are connected in a way that doesn't require explanation of where you came from of your language of who you are of nothing right so one of the things that was very important in my familial and like cultural kind of background is we have very structured, limited gender roles. And it's not that we don't have that here in the U.S. or in Western right. countries, right? <laughs> right? However, we do have at least this ideal of gender equality, let's say, in the United right. States. That's what I learned growing up, right? And so there was this always this conflict between these traditional norms of like Colombian, Catholic, Latin American heritage, right? That were always at odds with this ideal that I'm learning about, but I get to be whatever I want and I get to try things um, mm -hmm. and I don't have to be limited to what I experience or what I achieve or what I pursue based on my gender. So I'll give you like an example, playing soccer. I freaking love playing soccer. I'm very, I'm very physical in my body. I, I love martial arts. I did martial arts for 10 years. I just love punching, slamming, <laughs> choking. Okay, I love strength training. I love the idea of strengthening my body. And all of these things in our cultures are considered masculine. They're considered male dominated. They're considered socially acceptable for men to do, for boys to do, not for girls, right? right? And that is changing really slowly because human beings change very slowly. Um, but while I was growing up, that was a huge source of contention, right? And I was amazing at soccer. And I feel like my family, like, you know, as long as I was playing, like, you know, for play, like in the, you know, they, they <laughs> didn't pay attention to it. But once I started getting competitive and I was better than the guys, than the boys, yeah. Then it was like, yeah, soccer's not for girls. And it was really hard for me being, you know, 10, 12 years old and going, but I love this sport and you all love this sport. You watch this sport all the time. You watch all the World Cups. Like, why can't this be as important for me to do as it is for you to watch? Right. Right. So that was like a huge thing. And, and it was just kind of one of those things that I just had to accept that I wasn't going to be allowed to do. So let it go, right? Um, and there were a lot of different examples like that. Like the kinds of things that I wanted to do with my future were very limited in my familial perspective to 
be like housewife raised kids, like the traditional roles that women are allowed to do, right? And that I knew was like, not for me, not that motherhood wasn't for me, but that that wasn't exclusively what my life was going to be like. Right. Like I, I, I didn't know what it was going to be, but I knew it was going to be big. And I, and I knew it wasn't going to be, this didn't feel big enough. This, this felt like, yes, something I want in my life that is going to be included in my life, but it's not going to be my life. That's not right. going to be the end all of my life. And so when I started college, <clears throat> basically as an undergrad, uh, I did what most of us do, which is enroll in a degree that satisfies our parents' expectations, right? And as much as we might not be able to see that truth um, when we go to college because we're young adults and our whole lives we've been told what to do, and we, we think we're going to college to do what we want, <laughs> right. and we don't realize all of the unconscious stuff that we haven't learned to, we haven't grown enough self-awareness at that stage. Um, we've never really been given those tools to understand like, who is this really for, right? You may rationalize it as, this is for me, but that's just how you make sense of it. Not necessarily like what actually matters to you. And there's a, we can go, poof. I was going to say, that's a topic in and of itself. <laughs> that's, a, that's a whole other <laughs> podcast series. So when I went to college, like everybody else, I enrolled as a pre-med uh, because of, you know, that is, my mom always wanted to have a doctor in the family. And so I was like, I can do that, right? And so, and there was actually in like my first, at the end of the first semester as, as you know, as an undergrad, I hadn't even started taking like, you know, any kind of classes like related to like pre-med. But I, but I just had the opportunity to ask myself that question is like, what, who am I doing this for? Right. And I, and I'm pat myself on the back. Uh, because I had that clarity in myself to know this isn't for me. I'm not a pre-med for me. This is not what I want to do with my life. Like, I don't faint at the sight of blood, but I don't, this is not what I want my day-to-day -day life to be like, right? right. Um, so I was like, well, okay, whew. well, now that I've asked that question, what, what do I want to be my life? What do I want to do here in college? I have this opportunity to learn to understand something that is of meaning to me, that is valuable to me. What is the question? In a way, like, what's the question that wants to be answered in this case? Like, not asked. Um, and then I was like, you know, if I had to spend my whole life getting the answer to something that really bothers me, it is this whole, why is it so hard for me to do the things that feel natural to me when everybody else feels like it's not what I'm supposed to do because I'm a girl. So I had that clarity of like, this really bothers me. Yeah. And I don't understand what is at the root of this. And I want to find out. And so I was like, well, okay, what's a field where I could do that? And the only thing that I knew at the time was, I was like, well, it's psychology, right? It's about how people think. Mm -hmm. It's uh, people's, people's perceptions, people's minds. And I was like, okay, well, I'll just... That sounds good. I, like, I want to learn about that. So I went in and like enrolled in the, in, in the psychology major. And I started taking classes in two different areas. One of them was developmental psychology because I, have, I had an adverse childhood experience. <laughs> I had adverse childhood period, many experiences within that adversity. Um, and I really, I think I had this inner desire to understand honestly, Am I going to be really fucked up because of this? Or like, can I do so? Like, how has how have these experiences shaped me? Am I am I am I a lost cause here? What can I do about it? Like, you know, like after the fact, like I've already gone through these things. How can I? How can I? How can I work with with what I got? Right. Right. And I feel like a lot of people who go into psych, they go in it with this intention, unconscious or not, to heal something in themselves to learn sure. something, to, yes. to unravel something that is meaningful in themselves, right? And it was no different for me. So I did, so I did developmental psych. And then the other track that I did was abnormal psychology. And what led to that was my first class was in theories of personality. And it was a class where we looked at like all of the big like theorists, Jung, you know, Freud, 
-hmm. And we got to look at their own personal histories and understand how their own personal story, right, led to the theory that they discovered, which I thought was fascinating. Yeah, I was going to say, I want to take that class. If they hadn't gone through these experiences and had this own desire to answer those questions, right, to get the answers, yeah, they wouldn't have done that. They would have done something else. And so to me, like, that made such sense, right? Of like, yes, there's something here that needs to be, needs to be like, like explored for them too, because they're human beings. And in the process of that, one of the things that I just really got my, my own sense of was the things that we consider abnormal during certain periods of like human history are simply because we don't understand them enough. Mm. What is abnormal at one point in time is normal at a different time. The more we understand it, the more we understand, the more that we know, the more we know, right? And the less the things that become, that that have been abnormal, become normalized, right? right? Now, how are we normalizing them? That's that's a whole totally different thing, right? Are Are we making them normal? Or are we just recognizing that it's common? So that's what makes it normal, right? Mm. So, so those are the things that like I innately kind of got at it. And I said, this is really interesting. I was like, okay, well then I had to take a, uh, an elective, a social science elective. And I had the choice of sociology or anthropology, neither of which I really knew anything about. And so I asked my academic advisor at the time, I was like, well, what is anthropology? And she's like, well, it's like the study of human cultures. And I was like, oh, that's so awesome. I love learning about people from other places. I love learning about other languages. I love trying food from other places. There is something very, I I feel like natural and important to me about learning about other human beings who are not like me. Mm -hmm. And it, it was probably even more reinforced by the fact that I grew up at that time I was in Orlando, Florida and I was working at hotels. So like I worked on international drive, which is like basically like the most touristy like street in the whole freaking world. And because I worked at hotels and I worked in like reservations on the front desk, I was constantly meeting people day you know, in and out every day from other places. And I was always asking them questions about where they came from and what they do and what they love and what, you know, all of these different things. Like what are, what are the, the things that are different? And I feel like I never met a person that I couldn't talk to or couldn't strike up a friendship with mm-hmm. just because I came from a place of curiosity, right? A place of wanting to know more about them, more about their story, more about what matters to them as human beings, but also what matters to their group of people, right? Yeah. And I, I don't think I would have ever put those words to that back then, but now I, I understand. So this, this whole like, ooh, anthropology, that sounds amazing, was just like me having like a class where I get to learn about people from like, pe- like the world. I'm like, oh, this is perfect, awesome. I totally want to do this. And honestly... When I sat in that first class, by the end of that class, I had this feeling in my body like I was home. Like this profound, peaceful, um, very clear, energetic, like sensation, like right here. Like every time I tell this story, it, it always kind of comes up. It's like you just being able to elicit that sensation all right. over again and I didn't know at the time what it meant I just knew that this felt right for me mm. and so I mean I was already pretty far ahead into like my psychology degree and I was like well I'm gonna double major because I know I can't turn my back on this like and so I did I double majored and so I had my bachelor in psych and bachelor in anthropology and then I went on to do my PhD in anthropology because I, I knew that this was a place where I was going to learn what I needed to um And so it was, I feel like such a personal journey, but also a serendipitous one. Like if I hadn't needed this like social science elective, I I would have never even learned about what, you know, this, this field of anthropology. We, I stumbled on it and I feel, and a lot of anthropologists, uh, anthropologists stumble on the field. Um, 
there are a lot of people like who've learned about like Margaret Mead and like the big names. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, because it's not a field that a lot of people think is important, we don't learn about it. Right. I don't like, know. How do people not think that's important? <laughs> I don't understand that. Um, I can tell you why people rationalize it as not being important. And one of those, eh, there, there, there's, there's, there's business reasons. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then there's also um, our own beliefs get in the way, right? When you have on the one hand, the predisposition to learn about other people, which is important no mm-hmm. matter where they're from, especially in a place like the United States, where we're a mix of so many different nations yeah. and cultures. And you would think that that would be in itself valuable, right? Not just the indigenous people who live here, because I feel like that's how a lot of people get introduced to anthropology too, is because of learning about, and this is a good thing, right? About okay. native populations and the history there and everything. But it's also, we're in constant flux in the world and now more than ever, right? Because of things like the internet. How could we not place importance on understanding on the other human beings? Mm -hmm. And it's not standing them to understand our differences. I actually, the thing that I have found is I've lived in a lot of other countries. I've met people from all over the world. And to me, what I learned early on is it's not what makes us different that matters. It's what makes us similar and human beings. Honestly, it doesn't matter where you are in the world. We want the same things. We want belonging. We want love. We want safety. We, you know, we want our basic needs met. It really isn't that hard, Beckett. We make it hard. We make it hard because we look at everything else that is not that. Mm-hmm. We look at the, the old, old and tired and outdated paradigm of us versus them is the barrier to building relationship and community and a world where we can work towards a collective good because we're just so focused on me and my little group. That's all that matters. And we're going to have to let go of that. (laughs) Why do you think we do that? Because also as human beings, um, our predisposition is towards fear, Mm -hmm. right? It's the thing that in our human history, it has essentially allowed us to survive. Fear driven responses make us look at what is in front of us and go, this does not match my worldview. This does not match what I learned to be true. And therefore this is the thing that I have to protect. Right. And because as we know, the fear responses are the same, you know, whether it's a predator following you or yep. whether it's a belief system, right? We have to undo that first by kind of taking that proverbial like five steps back and going, what really matters mm-hmm. to me about this, right? What is the underlying issue? What is my fear? And is that fear a real thing that I have to worry about and that I have to feel unsafe about. And that's the thing is most of us don't have the inner resources or have learned how to even put a stop to the fear-based reaction enough to stop and actually think and reconsider and go, maybe I don't need this anymore. Maybe this isn't the belief system that is going to not just help me to move forward, me to build community, me to build a better world along with everybody else. See, that's the thing is that we've been so focused on our own personal survival, you know, throughout human history, um, and seeing everybody else as an enemy is just a, a natural way of protecting oneself. Right. But it's also the thing that builds so many walls between us, especially in an ever expanding world. Right. And there's a lot, there's a lot of layers of undoing that we have to all work on, but it starts with here, right? It starts with us. It starts with each individual person. I did a lot of diversity, equity, inclusion work 
<clears throat> and one of the things that was the most disconcerting for me about that work is I could do it in my sleep. Mm -hmm. I am great at making the observations as an outsider because when you are in a culture, whether that's a work culture, church, your, your geographic culture, your peer group, your whatever, we are part of many different cultures. Right. Okay. Um, but when you're in it, you're not always aware of the unconscious stuff, mm -hmm. the unconscious things in your own head and then the unconscious things that everybody else is reinforcing too. So as an outsider, as a consultant doing that kind of work, it's like, yep, I can see this. These are inconsistencies here, incongruities here. These are how you are not aligned with what you're saying that you're doing. These are the different practices as well as your beliefs. And these are the things that you're saying and kind of reflecting back to people. Here's what you said. And then here's what you're advertising that is important, right? And to show people those discrepancies as it's important to do, you have to show people those observations. Yeah. But the thing that it immediately makes people think is it puts them in a defensive stance of like, Oh, we don't do that. Like, like, you know, and if you are not willing to just see the truth and be committed to the real work, we're not going to make change. And man, that work pays really well. <laughs> it does. It pays really well. And there's a lot of companies and universities and nonprofits who I don't want, I, I'm not going to say that they're, oh, sorry. Um, okay. I'm going to say that I put up do not disturb. Okay. A lot of these different organizations are spending money because they, at some level, superficial or not, know that this work matters, knows that it, it has to happen, mm -hmm. right? The problem is, is that when you're spending so much money, like all these resources into this work, but you're not really willing to do the work that it actually takes to improve it, you're doing two things. Number one, you're wasting money. Mm -hmm. You're wasting valuable resources. Number two, you are furthering the problem because then there's this illusion that you're doing the work, that you are interested in, in making the change. But if at the end of the day, you're not willing to implement the recommendations to actually do better, then it's for naught. And I kind of just had this sense of, I, per, me, me being who I am and I'm, and I'm not judging anybody who does this work and, and tries because it's hard work and I'm glad that there are people who just are so committed to doing whatever they can. Mm -hmm. But for me, the sense that I got was I'm contributing to the problem. Mm. If I see that this is the truth of this work, that all it is, is a crossing off the list you know, doing a little checkpoint of, yeah, we do this work. And I know that the, that the real work isn't what's being invested in monetarily or in time and effort. I just feel like that work is empty. Mm -hmm. It wasn't fulfilling to me. It was very draining actually, <clears throat> because to me, I'm like, you're, I'm, I'm doing all of these interviews and I'm, and I'm, learning from all these, especially like in a, in a setting like university, right? Like all these students who need support, who want support, who deserve support from these different programs. And then I, I know the, I know the solution. I, I, I know how to fix this. It's not that I don't. And other people now know how to fix it. But if there's this, oh yes, this is, this was great work and we're, we're going to do what, what, you know, what was recommended and they, and they don't then there's this false hope that's being built in the process, mm -hmm. right? This hope of things will improve. And all that does is the more that we see, the more hope we put into it and the more that we see that that hope is misplaced, the further like down our morale goes. And I'm just, I don't want to be a part of that. So I realized, okay, um, at work matters. I, I am not the person to, to do that work. 
And it made me realize, I'm like, you know, before an organization can change, everybody in the organization has to be committed to change. Yes. It starts with the individual. And so I realized, you know what? That's where I have to focus my efforts on. I can't, you know, part of this, you know, part of diversity work is, and I hate this wording, but it's like <laughs> selling the value of diversity. Uh. And to me, like, I just want to throw up just seeing that. If you're not already committed and, and understand the value of diversity, like, I, I can't work with you. <clears throat> because you're missing the essential part to even begin working. Mm -hmm. Whereas like in coaching, as I talk to people, as I do workshops, as I do speaking engagements, and I talk about the importance of our own inner growth, right? The importance of our own daily choice to be better human beings. If that resonates for you, if that's something that you know has some importance but maybe you just have no idea how to go about it. I can work with that. Mm -hmm. I can work with that. I can, I can help you figure out what is the right path for you by helping you to look within yourself. Right. Not by me giving you the answers, right? Which is what we've all learned. We've all learned like, listen, and I am by no means saying that somehow like I am like this, I have my own inner internal resources and my own self-awareness that I've had since I was a little kid. It, it's a, it's been a great gift, but that doesn't mean that I am not a product of my own cultural conditioning too. That I, listen, I, I got all the way to like the highest possible like educational <laughs> achievement and got my PhD and everything because I, like everybody else, learned step one, step two, step three, go through all these steps, do all the things, do all your homework, do all the term papers, do all the, you know, do the research, do the writing, do the, ta-da, you get to the end and you, you get this nice paper prize. Right. <laughs> Expensive paper prize. <laughs> all right. Uh, I'm just as conditioned in that formulaic way of living as the rest of us are. And there are areas where it's even more challenging than in others. So let me give you an example. Part of, part of this is anthropology. One of those things that never made sense to me because of my own personal history with domestic violence, as well as um, seeing unfaithfulness in my family and in my culture, like in Colombia, mm -hmm. there's this, I feel like very um, common knowledge that men just cheat. Men are unfaithful. That's women's lot in life. They get married and they might as well, you know, expect that this is going to happen. And uh, perhaps this has changed because it's been a while since I lived in Colombia, but at least when I was growing up, hearing that, like, like, like the, the insinuation of it, as well as like the, the overtly stated idea that this is just women's lot in life. It just didn't sit well with me as a kid. Like, wait a minute. So this is not okay. We know it's not okay. We say that these things are not, you know, like even like from religious, you know, kind of like framework. And we say that like, oh, you know, faithfulness and like unity, like respect to the other, like all of these different things. But you're also telling me this. And like, like to me, that inconsistency was always so apparent and so... <clears throat> It, it did not compute. <laughs> That's the way I could put it. I was like, this does not compute. And I, you can try to make sense of it, but it doesn't make sense. It's, there's, there's an inconsistency here that's too major for me to ignore as a kid. Uh, and I could see, like when, for example, my biological father would be flirting with another woman and I mean, I was only like eight years old when I, I recall this particular moment. And, and to me, I just thought, this is not okay. Why is this happening? And calling it out mm. and then that being a bad thing, right? Calling out the truth as a kid. And it's, and it's a very natural thing for kids to do until you learn that you're not supposed to tell the truth. Right. Until you learn that you're supposed to be quiet and, and uh, you know, not 
report the observations that you've made about adult behavior <laughs> that is inconsistent, right? The whole do as I say, not as I do, BS. Um, and to me, I just, I just knew that something wasn't, wasn't right about that. And then through my own kind of like personal growth, you know, a lot of what I learned was, wait a minute, there's a lot of layers to this. Part of that is jealousy, for example, right? right? What do we learn about jealousy? What do we learn? About, like we, there's this, there's this inherent like underlying thing that's about not being enough, being afraid of not being enough. Mm -hmm. And it's something that, what did you learn about jealousy? Like you're, you're, you're in a completely different <laughs> human being altogether. What did you learn through relationships? And did you, is that something that you saw on faithfulness? Is that, and then you could talk about even movies and how this plays out in movies and the myth of doing that, right? But, you know, I realized that like my own train of thought is over here. I'm giving you my life so I was like, wait a minute, hold on. This is an interaction. Let's go. <laughs> No, that's a, that's a good, it's a good question because I myself in general, am not a jealous person. And so growing up, I didn't, you know, my parents were divorced, you know, my birth, my, my same thing, my biological father, I watched him date various women when we were kids and, you know, just didn't have anything to do with us. And it did, it just, he very much loved my mother, although they were not good and couldn't get over it. So he was very jealous and therefore really abandoned us as kids because he couldn't handle, you know, that, that she had moved on and was in a happier relationship and with my stepfather, who's still my father to this day. And, yeah, and so that played out a lot in my relationships of a being afraid of commitment because I saw marriage didn't work. You know, we were that first generation of kids where divorce was the bad thing. Yes. Do you know what I mean? It was like you were the latchkey kids and you raised yourselves and, you know, you did all the things, you know, so we dealt with that. So it made me fearful of commitment of, of marriage. It gave me a huge abandonment wound. Why is my dad not wanting to come around? Why? And I didn't actually find out till much later that my stepfather was my father's good friend. So, you know what I mean? It was much later where I asked my mom, you know, did you cheat? You know, and she's like, well, why is that important? You know what I mean? Why? And it wasn't actually, because now I was an adult. I wasn't a kid. Do you know what I mean? And, and I was going to th through therapy at the time and I wanted to understand. And I said, because I've always had this thing that my dad didn't want to be around because of me. I did something wrong. So I'm trying to go through that. And I said, so I don't care if you did. You, you were 18. She was 18 when she got pregnant. You know what I mean? She was young. The first. So she said, yes, I did. And I said, okay, that's all I had to know. Because in that moment, knowing that, it changed everything for me to realize it wasn't me. He couldn't handle the situation. Mm -hmm. And so he didn't show up. And that doesn't excuse him for what he continued to do. Make no mistake. You know what I mean? But it, so it really put my life together, really, to help me understand the bigger picture as an adult and, and, and let go of that abandonment wound to understand that. You know, it wasn't me. There was a jealousy thing going on there. There was abandonment issues and it just, you know, there was unfaithfulness. And for whatever reason, it didn't work. So that, you know, for me innately, though, as a human being, and I don't know what it is. People have asked me this. I'm not innately jealous. Like I've seen people hit on my, yeah. Like, I'm just like, and, and I'm not going to say, I'm, listen, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go and say it was innate. Because I had my own ab abandonment issues and there's like, and as a kid, I'm just going to call this out too, because I feel like this is so important and it doesn't matter how many times we hear it, we, we need to hear it more. Unconsciously as children, when we are not treated well, when we are not treated with the love that we all deserve, our brains, our own internal coping mechanisms come in to help and they don't always help in the best ways. It just helps us to make sense of things and sometimes it makes sense of things in like the worst possible ways. I, my, my extended family was f incredibly physically abusive. I mean, chillingly abusive. Um, but I always had this understanding that this isn't me. This isn't my fault. I am a good kid. I am a good student. I'm smart. I do what I'm told. Like I would go through these like 
did I do anything to deserve this? And the answer was always no. And so there was this, this kind of inherent for me understanding of this is not me. And, and at the time when the, some of these horrors were happening, I was also with my brother who was seven years younger than me. And he was like about two to three years old at the time. And I saw him getting abused. And to me, that was further reinforcement that hell no, he did not deserve this. Hell no, he did not deserve the kind of horrors that were inflicted on him that I got to witness. We did not deserve that. I, I just had this firm, unrelentless, like conviction, knowing that this was not our fault. And what mattered in that moment more than anything was also like the next thing, which is this inner understanding and resolve that I didn't have to be like these people. Yeah. I don't have to be like them. I don't have to be abusive and unkind and horrible like them. I can be better. And there was like this commitment at that young age for me to be better, for me to never inflict pain on a kid. And let me tell you, as a parent, a lot of those wounds came up and, 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 and a lot of the unconscious stuff I really had to work on because no matter how much that commitment is, it's the sometimes like the embodied stuff that really shows up in ways that you, you can't, you can't foresee. You, yeah. They don't come up until they're triggered. Right. And then, and then you deal with them and then you work on them. However, from the, from the, from the jealousy standpoint, they, there were things that I was jealous about and things that I, I wasn't in relationships. I think one of the things that I learned from my mom was, and, and it's because I heard her say it, not because it was an innate thing. She would always like comment on like women who were um, fighting with each other over a guy. And she's like, no man in the world is, is worth this. No, mm -hmm. there is no human being on earth that is so valuable that you abandon yourself. And that to me stuck so, so much. <laughs> And I thought, I'm the prize here, <laughs> right? It was this like reframing of, mm -hmm. I have to give myself the worth mm -hmm. and the value and the love and the attention and the affection. And I, I'm the one that gets to do that. And there were times when that faltered, you know, I'm not gonna lie. But overall, there was this sense of, I am worthy, I'm mm -hmm. worthy. And when people play these games that unfortunately, again, media and also the way that they see other relationships in their lives, the things, the silly things that people do to like, you know, win someone or guilt someone into like marrying them, like all, all these tropes that we see, right? Um, to me, I always saw that as, man, you're expending a lot of energy. <laughs> to try to convince this person to be with you. If they don't already, if they're not already convinced that you are worthy to be with, like none of this stuff, none, none, none of this effort really matters. Like, even if you convince them at the end, I don't know, there, there's this, you know, we, we have again, like we, as an anthropologist, where the beliefs, the thought process, the collective conscious and unconscious things that we say, Right. right? Um, that we believe that we pass on to others through either our words or our example. It's, this is how we build these, 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 I feel like frameworks and, and rules of life. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring this one up very specifically because this is one that is uh, always makes people twitch. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Great. Bring it. Okay. Marriage relationships. Why are they just two people? Right, we learn very specifically, and and depending on your religious, you know, tradition, right, one man and one woman, or, you know, and, and even when when you've, when you're out of that particular belief, and you think it's two people, even if it's just two people, why do we marry? What is the point of it? Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, we don't stop to think about it. We we just we just have this romanticized view that this is how you cement love. This is how you demonstrate and shout out to the world, this is my person. And how do we 
do that. Let's look at symbolism in this case, right? So like, I, I don't have a wedding band on. Right. Well, that was a token of right exchange when it was started, mm-hmm. the history of it, right? Like right. I'm paying you with my daughter. Right. <laughs> you are my property. <laughs> right. Or the cow that you're giving, whatever. Do you know what I mean? Exactly. <laughs> Thanks for the cattle. Right. Here's my daughter. <laughs> yes, exactly. You know, I was explaining this to my to my nine year old, because um, she 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 you know just kind of figured she's like, why is your last name different than Daddy's? And I was like, well, all right, let me give you a little bit of a, of, of a background. <clears throat> and part of that is like you like you said, right? You are and I am too, um, of that generation where divorcees. Huge stigma. Huge. Huge. Being a single mom. Huge, huge stigma. Getting remarried. Huge stigma. And part of that, and I don't know how this was for you, um, seeing your mom kind of go through things, but for me, um, there, there are layers on layers of this, but the biggest thing here is that as I watch my mom divorcing from this physically abusive, you know, violent person, mm-hmm how hard it was for her to do that in so many different ways, socially, financially, legally. And she had changed like many women do unconsciously for this like love, we're doing, building one family together. And they, they unconsciously like the thing that they do, the tradition, the, the thing that we all do without any thinking is taking on you know the husband's last name. And she did too, because again, that's, that, was, that was what you do. It's just what you right. do. And, and people don't stop to think, why do we do that? <laughs> you do. Uh, and that is reason enough. And it, and it never is. It never is reason enough. And for her to claim her, her birth name was such a struggle. It took so many years. It took so many legal battles. It took so many years for her to finally get her name back. I, this is my second marriage. I was married. Um, and in the first time, I decided I wasn't going to go through all of that. And I compromised by hyphenating my last name. My mom did that. Yes. Now she did that yep. so her children, right, uh-huh. would have the same last name. Gotcha. But it had this long, but so I understand because it's very, that was a very popular thing. It's a compromise, right? Yeah. It's, a, it's this, I'm not deviating from, right. you know, our culture. I'm just <laughs> modifying it, right? <laughs> and deviance, that word, it, it's important. It matters because how far you stray to where we consider it deviant or like non-conforming like that matters in culture right. we, and this extends to so many different things but we're, we're on the subject of marriage um so when i was explaining to my daughter i said you know i hyphenated my my last name your daddy wanted me to take on his last name for the same reasons that everybody else is mm-hmm. but we are family and i don't want you to blah 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 and i'm like yeah i've heard this before no i love you I love you and changing my name or keeping my name is not going to change how I feel about you. It's not going to change my commitment to you. Mm-hmm. It's not going to change how we raise kids together. And the biggest thing, and this is what I told my daughter, I said, you have to also ask a different question, which is why am I willing to give up my identity mm-hmm. to build a life for somebody else? Our names matter. Our you know, and there may be lots of reasons why somebody might want to not have their birth name, right? Mm-hmm. Completely valid reasons, and that's fine. But do it because it's a conscious choice, right. not because it's just what we do. And so I told her, I said, listen, my own history, having seen my mom go through all of this, I don't want, I don't want to do the same. There's, there's no reason to do it. And the second thing is, there is no reason for me to change even my name to form a union with another person. In fact, there's no reason to even marry mm-hmm. to form a union with another person. It's, it's a ceremonial and legal thing. And yes, there are many reasons why you might want to do that. Assets being together, but there's also places like I'm in New Mexico right now where you don't, you don't have to have that, right? Mm-hmm. So it's not a need. It's, it's just a norm. And I said, you know, there are, for me, I feel like my stepdad was my dad, my daddy. Um, he gave me so much. He did 
incredible things for me that I, I, I constantly tell him how grateful I am to him because he never treated me as a stepchild, right? You, again, tropes, cultural tropes, right? You hear these, you know, the step parents and the step mom and the evil step mom and the step, you know, um, as being like a negative thing. And that's not what he was at all. And even after he had his own biological kids with my mom, my dad never treated me and my brother different than my sister mm-hmm. and my brother, my youngest. And that's a huge gift. Huge. For a kid. For a kid, it's a huge gift. Because you are always in this mode of, I am not enough. I am not worthy of their love. They don't love me as much. Right? Because you're a kid and that's all. You, you as a human being are just concerned about being loved and deserving love. Right? That's a basic human need. And so for me, I'm like, this is my, keeping my last name is as much about me and my individual identity as it is about me honoring my dad. Mm. And that matters to me. That matters to me. I don't have to change my name to belong to somebody else's family. And there's a lot of things in my life that I had to I had to reframe what does belonging mean to me? Good question. And it's, it's a hard question to ask because again, it's a basic human need, right? Right. But we often feel like in order to belong, other people have to accept us. And that's a lie. Ooh. In order for us to belong, we have to accept ourselves fully, exactly as we are different and maybe in a way unaccepted by others. I have learned that when I, as I have come into more and more full acceptance of myself, I have not had that, say, primal <laughs> need to have other people validate who I am, accept or celebrate who I am. I just am. And I am the same way that I am with you right now, whom I just met. I am with everybody else. And there is an incredibly powerful sense of freedom and peace and joy when you arrive there. That is inexplicable. Until you get there yourself, you don't know what, what freedoms that comes with. And I often hear people, you know, kind of like rebutting, depending on what your story is, right? right. Of like opportunities, you know, require for people to accept you and to... There are opportunities that do, <clears throat> and I can recognize that. But there are also a lot of opportunities that you do that where people don't accept you and where people will constantly tell you how you don't belong. Right. And as long as you're there for you and you're doing it the right way and you're, and you're building, I would say, I would say a barrier, but a, at the very least a boundary to shield yourself from that, that which is not yours. That's their shit. It's not yours. When you learn to do that and you give yourself that, that gift of self-protection, you just step in the world differently. And it's a process. It's a habit that you build. It's a, it's a practice. It really is. One of the things that a lot of people will say when, when, when they meet me, when they see me for the first time in a space is... Um, there's this recognition of like, you have this really strong presence, this really strong energy. And I get it now. Like when people used to say that before, I'm like, I have no freaking clue. (laughs) And and try as I might, because I went through this period too of like wanting to be invisible. Okay. Right. Um, I, my, part of my conditioning was don't draw attention to yourself. Okay. Um, and I learned like many women do many girls do that you can be smart or you can be pretty if you're smart and you're pretty people aren't going to take you seriously okay um and i hear this so much i'm in the place where we literally have more phds per capita in this place than anywhere else in the world really yes and that and i hear this so often from women is even though they're women who are very well accomplished who have phds who that they cannot show up fully in their roles at work, in the lab. They're male managers, 
will not give them curious projects or challenging projects if they look attractive. And it's an unconscious thing, right? This is part of diversity work, right? We're kind of, yeah, I feel like we're coming full circle, <laughs> <laughs> right? It's that unconscious bias. It's not, it's not good enough to call out that we have unconscious bias. You have to do the work to unlearn it, to recognize when it's rearing its head right. so that you can disrupt that, so that you can do better. So for me, part, part of my conditioning was like, don't be the center of attention, you know, be quiet. Don't, you know, I'm, I'm naturally a leader. Like I hate leadership voids. Um, like I'm, I'm happy to follow again, conditioning. I'm happy to follow a good leader, but if you're a shitty leader, I, I will either push you <laughs> on the stairs and make a void or somebody else will, and I will step in to fill the void until, you know, a better option comes around, but I would not volunteer to be in that position unless it was absolutely necessary and i and i learned in the past few years that part of that was it, how i tried to deal with that is i would go into a room and i would always be in the back like doing like being in the background blending in like observing people like that's just who i am naturally and, and it's also who i am as, a, as an anthropologist right. and then realizing like I would still always end up in the center of a room. I would still always end up in the spotlight. And I, it does not matter, did not matter what I would do. It would always happen. I'm like, what? But I was trying so hard, like, not to be in the spotlight. What is this dynamic? I'm like me. <laughs> I, I, yes. And I think that that's why you and I would be like, hey, we should talk. Yeah, let's do it. Right? Like, and immediately there was like this, like, energy like i don't know where it came from i'm like yeah, but we but we know at this stage of our own growth too to trust that right, right? to trust that and to to not be ashamed of it mm -hmm. um to not be ashamed of it and i think that that's where i'm like oh man before i was like oh okay I'll, I'll do it but like there's a sense of reluctancy that had to happen to be okay yeah like i didn't want that yeah i'll totally do that it's like um, okay, yeah, sure. You know, there is this hesitation. Whereas now I'm like, I can't keep doing that to myself because I am not going to achieve my purpose in this world by being quiet and by hiding behind somebody else. Plus I it just, takes a lot of energy to keep holding yourself back, especially when you keep getting pushed yes, <laughs> forward. It really does. You're absolutely right. Um, and I didn't realize that. I didn't realize like how much, how much drain that resistance was causing. Mm -hmm. And, and it's like, wow, you know, when we're in our, in our best, most natural state, it's easy. This whole BS about things having to be hard in order to be deserved or earned mm -mm. is it, crap. It is. And, and it's one of thousands of things we have to unlearn. Um, and it made me realize, I'm like, yeah, man, I'm expending so much energy doing this thing, but I can be redirecting that in a better way. And, and I just have to let go of the, of the conditioning. And that's a hard task, but it's also a worthwhile task. And I feel like the more that people can give themselves permission right? Mm -hmm. To be everything that they are like that matters. And I didn't realize too, the more that I gave myself permission to do that without any prompting or any direction, I think it just automatically gives other people permission to do the same. It does. It's such a weird, like, <laughs> um, chemical, I don't know, like, you know, like energetic shift that happens just by you working on you like you can change the world just by working on yeah. bettering yourself and that's both lovely and profound but we also need more people doing that work right it's the embodiment work i mean and, the, and i was just talking about that like you can read a hundred self-help books or go to workshops or hire a coach but if you're not willing to do the work you're not willing to integrate it to embody it then you've just read a hundred self-help books like nothing's changed yeah you know, and I think that's why I love, to me, how, how do you not want to study other cultures? How do you, especially like when you're talking about gender right now, right, and the inequality we're dealing with, what do you think is our, our greatest 
deconditioning we need to do when it comes to that. Because to your point on marriage, I met a couple in Sedona when I was hiking and they talked about the name change and she purposely wasn't going to give up her name. And in fact, he took hers as a way of just, I guess, a big F you to the tradition of like, (laughs) I'm not, I took hers because it's, you know, what is it? What is the point? And he goes, and I was honored to do that. And so I think, what can we learn right now? Like, what is the biggest thing that you see as we need to decondition when it comes to gender, especially in the United States? Learn the entire framework of gender. And I say that because the way that we have all learned is there's two, it's binary. There's men, there's women, right? Um, One of the things that I was, it was one of my first lessons always in an anthropology course is teach people the distinction between sex and gender, right? Sex is biological, and it is not only male and female. There is a third category, which is intersex, and it is because, and you don't, and I know that people kind of go like, oh, there's not that many, you know, those those are aberrations. Like you can, you can, the way that people talk about it is as being a, this is a, let's say, mutation and it's not normal. And the more that we look at the statistics of how often it happens and how often we don't, and how little we know about it because the default thing to do when a kid is born is to assign a sex at birth. I know. Um, And because there's usually only two boxes, somebody has to choose. And somebody has to choose with or without doing any kind of surgical procedure. And this is the thing that people really don't understand. And I, and I, 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 I'm always very open to educating and informing, right? Because I feel like part of it is people's fear is because they're cemented in their belief and because they don't know better, right? They don't know differently, right? The intersex can mean a lot of different things, but it is biologically based. And there are a lot of chromosomal varieties. We all learn XX and XY, and it's so pretty because it's so simple and that's all we need to learn. But there's so much human complexity, even in the physiological, genetic, you know, chromosomal kind of aspect of things. If people got to really understand just how much variety there is, even at a, even at a physiological level, I feel like we could start having better, more compassionate discussions about gender, right? Because gender is the the cultural, the social, the behavioral expressions of a person's physiology, right? I feel like right now, especially with like trans kids, um, there's this pervasive, I feel like, conversation. I just literally this morning saw this comment um, cause we're having pride week here too, where we are like that we are in a lot of places. Um, and somebody made this comment of, um, there's this rock that gets painted here, like in, you know, for different like events and things like that. And, and somebody's comment was like, oh, they, they mutilated the rock, like trans people mutilate themselves. And I thought even the, the choice of words, right. Reflects the person's understanding or lack thereof. It is a visceral reaction to something that that person and many people have learned to believe as a truth that cannot be changed. And the thing with the truths and with beliefs is people feel, people have this, this inherent feeling, idea, belief that it is unchanging, that it is, it just is. And a truth is not unchanging. You can change your perspective about the truth. A truth is just something that you believe as being true. A belief is just something that you have put your energy and your faith into. Understanding is the way that things work, which can also be changed. But because we have learned that we, that our beliefs make us who we are, it becomes unconsciously cemented as part of our identity. I am the person that I am because I believe in these things. The person you are doesn't change based on your beliefs. You are who you are, no matter what you believe. You just believe different things. Your thoughts are different. 
and you can change your thoughts. And why would you not want to change your thoughts if it means sharing love, spreading kindness, being compassionate towards other human beings? So for me, when I was teaching anthropology, and, and still now when I have this conversation about sex and gender, I explain to people, I give examples of like people from other parts of the world, right? Because again, the earth versus them, it's very easy for people to go, oh, that's how they do it in their culture, but that's wrong, right? It's right. the ethnocentrism. My, my culture is what matters. My culture is right, right? And then you start kind of dismantling, like, what does that mean in that culture? What have you learned in your culture about this particular topic? about homosexuality. How has that changed over history? What do you yeah. think about it now? What, and where are we now in, in that topic? Because it's a different conversation now, because we're looking at things. Remember what I, what I said from the beginning of like the things that are considered abnormal at one you know, time yeah. in history, like see where we keep coming full circle. Um, <laughs> the more that we understand, the more that we start learning, and this is gonna take some time, especially because there's a lot of resistance and people to accept it as normal. Um, the more that we understand about how gender works, the more that our <sighs> really negative and reactive and violent feelings, people of different genders or gender fluidity or being transgendered, the more that will change and that will become then more normal. There's, a, there's this um, study that came out not too long ago, and say in the past six months, looking at gender dysphoria and looking at the brain. Mm -hmm. How does the brain respond to like people who are cisgender, so people who are men and women, male, female, who subscribe to that particular category versus people who are transgendered or, or people who are genderqueer or have like, you know, fluid gender identities. And they showed them pictures of different, you know, cisgendered, um, you know, people and people who were trans and they were looking at how the brain was responding to the different pictures, just the pictures. And in the people who were cisgendered, how they identified mattered to how they responded. And it was an unconscious thing. It was just brain waves. It right. was just brain activity, right? And for the people who were gen what we call gender dysphoric, who do not match um, in some way biologically to the to the behavioral aspects or the you know or the identity aspects of their gender, they had a very strong negative reaction to the cisgendered, but they had a more, you know, I feel like peaceful. Like your brain just how 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 it responds to the ones that were not cisgendered. So this is not even looking at how people think. Right. This is looking at your brain activity, right? That was a new study. And I feel like that was really telling because this is not about people performing like, oh, that, you know, because I feel like a lot of people like who don't understand it or don't have the experience of being, you know, uh, gender queer um, or gender fluid or transgender, there's this, there's this, knee-jerk reaction to want to make it as though it's deviant, mm -hmm. as though something is wrong with that person, or they're just making it up, or it's because their friends are, are transgender, and now they are too. And it's like, there is no agency given to the person for what they feel in their own body, right? And there's just, just, we have a lot of work to do. One of the things that annoys me about how we don't value fields like anthropology is we take it for granted that because we're human beings, we know how human beings work. We're all human beings all the time. <laughs> People are the same, right? No. <laughs> and we are all each unique, complex, nuanced human beings especially when we are aware and conscious. It's when we're unconscious that we do the things like everybody else. Like people are the same. Right. We all do the same thing when we are not present. And it's 
bring in that awareness. Like one of those things that I learned, like after, after I did coaching training, um, I looked back and I was like, what is it about anthropology? Like what were the, what were the times that I was teaching that I felt like I, that mattered, that, that where I felt like I was making an impact. And you know what's funny? It's actually when I had students squirm in their seats at during lessons when I was exposing a belief that was deeply held for them and I got to turn it on its end. And then they got to see, oh, wait a minute. And it was like somebody woke up something that was deeply held for them and they hadn't known, they hadn't realized it. They, they, were, not, they were not conscious of it. And once somebody turns on that light, once you see that truth, you can't unsee it. You can ignore it, but you can't unsee the truth. So for me, I can see how, even as an anthropologist, part of my work was the awakening part. Mm. Was the bringing, by talking about the things that people feel uncomfortable about or people take for granted, and help them to develop that critical thinking, that's when I'm like, okay, being a critical thinker is important for you to see the world. But the, the same critical thinking skills are required for introspection. But they're two separate things. One is about the outside. Right. The other one is putting that proverbial mirror in front of your face <laughs> and going, this applies to me too. Okay, let's just get comfortable being uncomfortable. Right. Well, people don't want to ask questions. I mean, I appreciate you saying that because, and it's not something, it comes up, but I've had the conversation. I'm transgender. So, you know, going through that and into the journey and having friends, and I always say I welcome conversations, you know, but when I was transitioning and I was going through that, my friend sent me a documentary done on Hawaiian culture and their view of transgender. Mm Mm-hmm. And how they really embraced it and even to this day have like schools to teach the old culture that they they looked at transgenders as more reverent. You know, and it actually lifted them. So they had like a a female who ended up dancing in the tribes, you know, warrior dances, but was transgender and felt more male. And it's like, I I just, and it's interesting because I had a conversation on Facebook this week that someone tagged me about trans athletes. It was like the whole thing. Female trans athletes shouldn't be competing with other females. Women can't overcome men. You know, and and normally I let, I understand people have an opinion and it's your opinion. And unless you're asking me, it's not my job to try to change your opinion. You know what I mean? But I was tagged in it. I was like, and then she's like, you know, this is why you don't see trans males in men's sports. And I'm like, so I just responded back and I'm like, that's not accurate. And she's like, well, you're not going to change my mind. I go, I don't want to change your mind. What I'm asking you to do is have an informed opinion. And so I listed an article of where a woman just completed the Navy SEALs competition and took out all the men. You know, and another article where a female athlete overcompensated and won. Like, not overcompensated, but beat men. Do you know what I mean? Like, you do see women, like you were talking about in soccer. You were better. I played soccer for 13 years. Do you know what I mean? Like you see women who can outplay the men. And and then I tagged another article of a first trans male who won his first boxing fight competing with other men. So I'm like, I don't mind your opinion, but make it an informed opinion because what you're putting out here isn't accurate. You know what I mean? That's the thing. And so we can't keep spreading these narratives because you believe something. I said, you understand, as a transgender population, we make up 0.01% of the population. So when people go, there's this transgender movement. Yeah, there's a huge, that's a huge movement. 0.01%. Like, we're this big. <laughs> you know what I mean? And she was like, well, I appreciate the feedback, It's but I'll have to look into that. I said, go ahead. You can still have your opinion. And I've told people, you don't have to understand my journey. You don't even have to agree with it. But you will respect me as a human being. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And go, going back to what you mentioned, too. So in anthropology, like the, the category that when we talk about gender, the category that that, that falls into is like two-spirit or, mm-hmm. or um, there are... So in India, there are uh, the hijras. There are... So they're in, in different cultures, there are different... Um, 
and this is pre-colonialism, right? Mm -hmm. um, pre-conquest, pre the dominant, you know, patriarchal uh, religious influences, okay? Um, you see in a lot of native traditions and a lot of indigenous cultures, this understanding that this is, to use a word I, I used earlier, like this is normal. This yeah. is, there is nothing abnormal about this. Some people are like this and they are part of us. Right. right. And just because there is a dominant genders, right. That doesn't mean that the other ones get excluded. Right. In our world, we kind of tend to do the opposite of if you are not like us and, and we can, we can apply the same thing to ableism. Okay. Yes. So that yep. we have a lot of work to do, but all that to say, um, you mentioned earlier, like part of the question was like, what is it that we have to like unlearn and, 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 and decondition ourselves from. Yep. And then I started saying about like even the concept of gender, right? Even in the most well-intentioned and this drives me a little batty. Uh, the most well-intentioned, like, spiritual, like, influencers and coaches and everything, there is still this, like, ugh, predisposition and just attachment to labeling things as masculine energy and feminine energy. And Beckett, I fucking hate that. And, and I'll tell you why. I tend to be a more... I'm very expansive. I'm very... We are... We learn to see the world too simplistically right we learn to see people too simplistically and that's not how people are that's not how we are and so we see ourselves simplistically and that's just not who i am naturally and, and that's also not the observations that i've made of the world and that's just not how people are <laughs> just <gonna> quite <laughs> say. and so for me even something as well-intentioned as labeling energies as masculine or feminine feminine you're still separating you're still making this you're, you're still attaching labels to what what things are in this realm versus this realm so like the more being is feminine and doing is masculine jeez i am a very strong person i'm a, a very very strong being, I'm a very strong entity, human, I don't know. <laughs> there are things that I am, I'm a complete mix of. And I consider myself cisgendered. And there are a lot of things about me that fit right with me being my own definition of a woman, <laughs> which is not in line with our society's definition of what women look like, do, how they behave, how they operate in the world, what they believe, and, and, and all of that. And, and I think that that's where I'm like, immediately, like, it makes me twitch when people are like, you know, the, the feminists, and uh, we are all a mix of things. Right. And, and labeling them as masculine or feminine is part of the problem. They are just ways of being. They are not, they do not belong to one or the other, you know, sex, gender, way of life. Like, if we just dispense with the labeling, with this, with this knee-jerk way of like attaching a category to things, and it's a, and it's a very understandable, totally normal human thing to do. Okay, I, I get it. We learn to survive by categorizing things. Right. The brain likes labels. Yes, the yes. brain likes order. Yeah. Hey, I'm OCD. I like order too. But also, I am not limited to being a to, to being fit on how I see things. Yes. Right? We are by nature expansive. We are by nature capable of change. We are by nature evolving, always evolving, always changing. It is our predisposition as human beings from everything from genetic, you know, ge our genetic makeup to like, we are just a, a constant flux and combination of different people and different energies and different things all the time all the time nobody lives isolated to where they are unchanging and even if they even if they were isolated their brain can change <laughs> so it it irks me that there's this there's this fixation on keeping things simple 
on making things simple because that that's part of the problem. Yeah. It is in seeing people as complex, nuanced, and ever-changing that is going to lead us to where we need to go next. And I don't, I just, I know that for myself. And it's honestly kind of, let's say annoying and frustrating because it's like, okay, how do I, how do I breathe life into that for others? How do I, how, how do I help others to be part of that change that we need to see? How, how do we invite others to shift their entire life ways into this other, other, a different inclination? Because it requires trying to enroll people in this program where you get to shift everything about yourself, like everything in the way that you've known, not everything about yourself. But knowing what things are yours and what things are your conditioning and knowing that the world is not going to change by you stepping out of the unconscious learned fears and beliefs. Yeah. This is actually the work that we all have to do to do better for everyone. Ourselves included, right? It starts with us. That's amazing. And it leads me into the question that I ask everybody which couldn't have asked for a better intro because I want to know your answer. Um, in a world constantly seeking answers, what's the most powerful question you've asked yourself that led to a profound shift in your perspective or life direction? I'm going to, the thing that's coming up is, what did I learn and is it true? And that sounds simple. That sounds like a simple question. Part of that is, what did I learn in my immediate environment? Mm -hmm. What did I learn from popular media? What did I learn from the figures of authority in my life? Teachers, um, peers, what did I learn visually? What, what did I see? What were the behaviors? But also, you know, what did I hear? Right? Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of almost doing like a mental, like, like an inventory of what are all of the things that are packed into this one thing, right? Let's go back to the example of marriage. What were the examples of marriage that I saw? What, were the well, what did I learn in movies about what marriage looks like? Mm -hmm. not, not the wedding. That's a whole other, that's a whole <laughs> other thing in itself, okay? What did I learn about marriage? What does marriage look like? What do relationships look like? What did I learn about that in my own life? Because once you start kind of building the inventory and like really asking that simple question and just, just making a note, okay, what, what, were, what were my examples? What did I hear? What were the messages? What were the sayings, the quotes, right, that I, that I learned? Um, then, you, then you can ask the next question, which is what is true about that? Hmm. What is true about that? Not just, not just based on that difference between what was said and what was done, right? What, what is true? Where's the, where's the congruence or the incongruence? But more importantly, what is true for me? Not what did I learn? What is true for me? What am I choosing to believe about this? What am I choosing to believe about what matters about this? What am I choosing to believe about what this looks like for me? So for example, like a few years ago, <clears throat> 2020, like, like, like for many people, right uh who were either on the brink of divorce or did get divorced because man that was a rough year for everybody and no exception on on and on my end and when i was you know kind of at the tail end of that year and really honestly ready to just be like okay let's just go sign the paperwork and get this done with i asked my husband i said you know think of a good example of marriage and and it can be celebrity it just any good example of what, what a good marriage looks like. And we just started thinking about it and we're like, no. Like, for him, the example of a good marriage is just being married for a long time. Wow. And that didn't feel right for him, right? That's not his truth. He's like, I don't just want to exist with someone for 50 years. I actually want to live well with that person, relate to that person, feel 
cared for by that person and feel care for caring for that person. And one of the things that I learned was this thing that you hear, and and, and I know you'll it'll resonate with you because we all hear, which is like this idealized romantic view of marriage as being, oh I want it, you know the person I want to marry is somebody I want to grow old with. We hear that that is very common. A common thing for us to to see in movies, to hear people say, right? I want someone to grow old with. Well, that could be your best friend. That doesn't have to be a marriage partner. But also, like, I don't want to just grow old, right? <laughs> with someone, I and it made, you know what it made me realize is like this opportunity for reframing for me and for for us. It's like I want somebody to grow with. Mm-hmm. Somebody that I'm going to be growing with as I age. Somebody that I'm going to be growing with in my, growing with myself, but also growing in my relationship with. That's a conscious belief. That's a conscious change. But I first had to come with this. All right, this inventory of like, okay, what were the examples? Were any of them good? <laughs> no. So. What is true about that, right? Mm-hmm. And then also, well, what is true for me? Right? So that's just, that's just an example, right? And I think, unfortunately, many of us have nothing but bad examples of marriage. So that's a good place to start. It's kind of benign, I feel like. Hey, we all want to have happy, you know, companionship, you know, lives and relationships. It, you don't have to get married. So I'll, I'll just throw that out there. You don't have to get married to be happy and in partnership with someone else. Um, you don't have to be married to have kids either. You don't have to be married to share assets either. Okay. So let's just throw all of that out there. You don't have to get married to be happy. And this is like one of those BS things too, that a lot of girls, I mean, still again, movies, I'm glad Disney has gone away from like the typical, like, you know, princess, you know, being saved story. Um, but still, there's a lot of reinforcement in popular media about, and, and we hear it, right? That's another thing that we hear all the time. This is your ha- the happiest day of your life. Yeah. Is the day that you get married. No. <laughs> no. No. Can we dispense with that? Like, this is not the happiest day of your life. I'm not saying it's going to be a crappy, the crappiest day of your life. <laughs> you know, like, let's not go that far. But um, if your, if the highlight of your life is dependent on the day that you get married, what else is there right. to live for? What, the, what else is there to look forward to? There's so much more to life than getting married. Why don't we then start paying attention to all of the other things too? I'm not saying that... M- that your wedding day can't be happy and that they, and that being married can be a joyous thing for you. If that's what feels like your truth, awesome. Mm-hmm. It's not our truth for everybody. It's this come this formula of like, you know, things that I'm supposed to check off on the road to life. And it's not for everyone. It doesn't have to be for everyone. It is okay if it is not for you. It doesn't mean that you're unworthy of love. It doesn't mean that you can't be in a joyful, loving relationship with one or many people. At the same time, if that's what works for you, that's fine. And I'm seriously saying that with no judgment, okay? Polyamory works for a lot of people because there are a lot of ways in which it can work. And you have to do a lot of unlearning about what those basic, simplistic rules of relationship and what relationships look like and, and the dynamics of relationships because there is a lot of inner work that you got to do to be in a pop. People, people, people like see it as like, oh, it's just like, you know, the, the, <laughs> the way to brush it off is just to be like, oh, you just want to have sex with a lot of people. I mean, uh, yeah. It can be part of it. It doesn't have to be. It satisfies a lot of different things depending on what makes sense for you and the community that you're in and the people that you're in relationship with. But it requires a whole lot of inner work for you to undo things like your own issues with abandonment and your own, your own wounds, unworthiness. And I mean, on and on and on. I mean, it is, 
it is intense. It is no joke, people. This is not an easy thing to like relationships. Okay, I'm just gonna <laughs> throw that out. Read some books. I feel like every monogamous, mm, monogamously inclined person <laughs> needs to read books on polyamory so that they can work on things that are going to inevitably show up in their monogamous relationships. Seriously. I agree. I mean, I used to, I think Aubrey Marcus, you know who he is? I'm sorry? Do you know who Aubrey Marcus is? No. He does a podcast. He was in an open relationship and he talks about that and eventually exited it out and, you know, ended up singly with a woman. But he said to be in an open relationship and date and they were very forthright and he goes, a lot of talk about jealousy came up for him and knowing and... He's like, it's not an easy journey. Like your demons come out, like whether you want them to or not, you have to face it to engage. And they're still very good friends. And, you know, he, him and his, his ex shared their whole journey. And I watched a docu-series too one time on polyamory and how, you know, to me, like you were saying, it makes sense in a way that thinking that one person is going to satisfy all your needs for the rest of your life as we change and expand doesn't make sense to me. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't understand how that, that works because we don't even have just one friend who deals with all our friends. Like we have multiple friendships. So I'm not saying it's something I could handle with polyamory, but I'm saying I can understand it and I don't judge it because to me, it makes sense. It does. If you think about it too, from the perspective of why are so many people who are married <laughs> for a long time uh, dissatisfied with their relationships? Right. I mean, there's a lot of things, right? Communication, which you work, you, you have to, you have to communicate when you're in a polyamory uh, you know, setting, uh, polyamory setting. It, it, it's communication is it, just as important in, in a monogamous relationship as it is in a polyamorous one. But it's also like, you get stagnant, you get resentful, and part of it is you get resentful and stagnant because you are expecting this one person to satisfy all of your needs in a way that maybe they never did and you just overlooked it, which happens and that is a hard thing to be like in truth with. It's, right. it's hard. You end up feeling, and I, and I notice this with my partner, there is a sense of how could I have overlooked this important aspect of life to me like i felt like i did i was missing the essential part of having a partner who i could be emotionally intimate with mm -hmm. and when i realized i was our relationship when we were dating we we never developed that 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 was never part of our relationship how the hell did i not see that mm -hmm. i i blame myself there was this sense of what were you even thinking? How could you have married this person who, who you had not built emotional intimacy with? Now, here's the thing. There's lots of different types of intimacy. Okay, a friend of mine uh, who's a coach, <clears throat> he is, um, you can find him, his name is uh, Jim Young, and he has this wonderful book called Expansive Intimacy. And I, 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 I jokingly tell him he saved my, my marriage in like five minutes because one of the things when as we were as my husband and I were getting ready to divorce. So that was end of 2020 and January, 2021, Jim came up with this series. It was five, five minute long videos talking about different types of intimacy. And so he talks about, you know, when we think about intimacy, we think about sexual intimacy, right? right? Which is one type of intimacy, but it's not the only one. So he, he, he labels these as there's emotional intimacy, experiential intimacy. So like doing new things with the person, Right? There's intellectual intimacy and there's also spiritual intimacy. And when, when I was listening to those, I thought, okay, wait a minute, how did we develop ours? Now, long, there, there's a long story with how my husband and I met, but at, basically the bullet point is we dated long distance for three years. Every time we saw each other, we were doing something new. We were traveling to a new place, eating in a new place, hiking in a new place, there was the experiential part. Like that's, we do new things all the time. Like that is how we bring life into our relationship is by trying new things. Even if it's a trying new recipe in the kitchen, it's a new experience, okay? Right. 
So I was like, okay, well, we had that. Have we been nurturing that? No, well, we haven't done anything. I mean, and that's life. We had kids. Uh, we were in a new place with no support system, so we couldn't go out on date nights. Like, there, there's a lot of different, like, logistical reasons why. But then I was like, well, that was important to us, and we haven't cultivated that in a very long time. Well, okay, that makes sense. Sexual intimacy, if there's no emotional intimacy for me, there's no sexual intimacy. So right. that's definitely not getting done. <laughs> and spiritual intimacy, at least at that stage in, in life when we met, like that wasn't really something that mattered to either one of us. It's not something that either one was focused on. So that one didn't matter. So, okay, no, no, no spiritual intimacy. The intellectual intimacy was the only thing that was honestly holding us together mm. the whole time because... I can have conversations with them about anything. Right. Right? Uh, politics, research, you know, whatever, you name it, and, and we can always have intellectual conversations, and, and, and that's very stimulating for both of us. And so it made me think, I'm like, okay, well, I can't have the emo like the sexual intimacy without the emotional intimacy, which we never had anyway, so we got to figure out how to get back to that. But the biggest thing is, how do we bring life into the experiential intimacy Especially like, again, like that was still during pandemic, right? right. Like we can't be going on, like all these things. And so we decided um, to have like date night, sacred Saturday nights, put the kids to bed, have time for him and I, try new recipes, try a new cocktail, whatever, and have that time for ourselves. And in that time, while we're building the experiential intimacy, be intentional about growing our emotional intimacy, getting to know one another. You so take for granted that you've been with this person for years and years and years and years and you know who they are. Yeah. You are wrong. I learned that from that experience. Like, wow, like your ideas change. Your relationship to your past history changes. The way that you, you know, think about things that you deeply held true might also change in different ways. Don't take for granted that the person that you've been married to for forever or the person that you've been in relationship with forever, including your friends or your fit, you know, your mom, um, that they are the same person that you've always known. They're not. Get to know them again. Get to know who this person is. It is in relationship with others that we learn about ourselves. Mm. And it matters to... Just the same way that we are ever changing, other people are too. And so, like, it's an invitation, right, to get intimate with yourself, to get to, again, like, explore what are the things that I've taken for granted that I need to build awareness on, that I get to choose consciously who I, what I believe in now and how I move forward in life with this new understanding and this conscious awareness of all of these different things that I'm bringing to light. Um, and then also just in the process of learning more about ourselves, we learn about others and we get to ask different questions and we get to build awesome, new, fun, you know, relationships with people we've never met. And we get to ask better questions and go from, how's the weather? Yeah, oh my how's God. the rain? <laughs> Whatever. You know, what'd you have for breakfast? How are you doing? Yeah, even the simple question of like, hi, how are you? And like not really expecting people to answer that honestly and say, you know what? I'm having a really hard day today. My dog died or whatever. It takes us aback when people answer a basic question fully. Mm -hmm. And it's because we're not asking the question with the right intention. So be more present to that. And being more intentional about the life that we want to create for ourselves, but also the lives that we want to co-create with others. That's beautiful. I could talk to you for hours. Oh my God. I'm already been two. <laughs> but I want to say thank you for that. Like, thank you for being here. Thank you for sh shining your light and sharing your story. And I definitely, I, there's already, I've got like five topics here. I'd already want to bring you back and talk to you about. <laughs> hey, I'm happy. I'm happy to do that. Um, you know, one of those things that I often hear, which is, uh, it's kind of funny. Like I've heard it for a long time. There's two things, which kind of re refers to like one of the things that you started with, which was, um, you know, people will tell you your life story and it's after they do that, that they're taken aback by why did I just tell you all of that? Yes. Right. <laughs> and 
I get it. Story of my life too. It's, that's just who we are and what we bring out in people. We, we bring out the tender parts that they know, they, unconsciously, like completely unaware. You, your being just needs to have the space to share that and it just knows that you're the person to share that with. You're the person that's gonna keep that, that truth tenderly and hold it with you, right? Um, and that matters. And, uh, and then the other thing is, uh, I hear a lot of people, <laughs> people saying, and, and I've always heard it, but I've, I'm allowing, I'm, I'm allowing myself to receive it, mm -hmm. which is, I could hear you talk for hours. And at first it would make me so uncomfortable because again, my conditioning yeah. of like, be quiet, don't take up too much space, don't yeah. say too much. And, and now I'm like, when I just allow myself to speak and to share and to be and to be with another person, sometimes I will talk more. Sometimes I will ask more questions. Whatever is meant to be born or transmitted or shared in that moment, just trust that it's okay, right? And it's like holding that part of myself that is tender. And it's like, it's okay. There is no shame and there is no, there is no need to feel wrong about it. It's, it's okay. Yeah. So I appreciate you holding that space for me and with me too. Absolutely. Where is the, if people want to get more of you, <laughs> where can they find you? Um, so they can, my, my website needs a, needs a redo, but, um, but they can at least contact me through the website, which is human hyphen empowered.com. Okay. I am also on Instagram. I just moved here from New Mexico or moved to New Mexico from Ohio a few months ago. So I've been kind of, uh, off the social media radar, but on Instagram, they can find me on Dr. Period Margie Serrato. So first name and last name. And, uh, I'm hoping very soon I will also launch my own podcast, which is currently registered, but um, not launched yet, but it's called A Human Experience. Mm. And so we're, it's basically going to be an extension of, again, like those shared human experiences and looking at it from the lens of like everything that I've learned in my life and in my <laughs> immense breadth of experiences, um, what I've learned about the world. There's a lot of anthropology in there too. Uh, and, uh, and so it's an invitation to kind of come and like, hear something that maybe you haven't heard before. And it's going to be short and, uh, keeping myself a little focused is, is, is a, is a good thing for these because I can, I'm a storyteller, <laughs> but I can also, I can also rain it a little bit. <laughs> I know, but it's hard. I mean, this is probably be the longest podcast I've done and that's okay. <laughs> It, it, it's okay because they keep getting longer and longer and yet people seem to enjoy them. So that's awesome. Yeah. That's so great. it's a beautiful thing. I'll have everything listed in the description boxes also for the listeners yeah. as well. So if you didn't get that, we'll have it on there. Thank you, my friend for being here. Absolutely. Thank you for being all of you. Absolutely. And everybody else stay curious, stay empowered and keep shining your unique light until the next one.